see me, you're going to see Jono. At least I hope you are. Uh -huh. Set <laughs> <laughs> the back. Jono, can you tell me what special day it is today? Today is World Beard Day. And Ginger Cat Appreciation Day, yes. and if you're this, yeah, that's good. <laughs> and, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll lean on yours, be fine. I mean, don't lean, don't touch it, don't go near it, but. Although I've talked at a lot of conferences already, this is actually his first conference. Yeah, we can. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, I think we're good. Can you hear me? Is your mic? Am I, am I, am I noisy? Am I all right? Do, do, what? I you're you're on a rummage right, in my pocket, on. right? Okay. That one's on. It's got a green yeah, light. Other one. I can hear me echoing. Oh, that's the one. No, you can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear me. We want to hear you too. <laughs> Where are these? Yeah, Why is there so much cable? There we go. That one's oh. very off. Yep, very off. <laughs> one, two. Yeah. Two on. One, two. One, two. There we go. That's better. The best biscuit is a custard cream. That works. <laughs> Pineapples digest the inside of your mouth faster than you eat them. Is everybody ready? <laughs> Should we go fast? Okay, so um, thank you very much for the intro. This is amazing. Um, I've lived and breathed WordPress for as long as I can remember, but I am very, very new to the word camp space and the open source space. And I'm in love with it, and I'm in love with all of you, and this is an incredible honor. Let's go very fast. Um, don't let Yoast see that, so I do odds and ends and weird stuff at Yoast that mostly involves breaking things and thinking about stuff like this. Today's plan is we are going to run you through some theory of speed stuff. Who was in the speed workshop this morning? Some of you, excellent. We're going to do, um, there's a little bit of overlap, but then we're going to go, yeah, you were there, obviously. Then we're going to go deeper and faster. Um, I'm not going to give you tons and tons of practical how-to speed stuff. What I am going to do is signpost um, a whole bunch of stuff that you can go away and learn on your own. What I'm going to do is talk you through what I've done and what we've done for Yoast.com to get it as fast as it is, and what we're going to do next, and to, um, touch on some advanced speed optimization stuff. Um, and I will share a whole bunch of awesome resources that you can go through and click links and find things. This is the slowest it goes. Here we go. Um, <laughs> It says there's a glossary, there is no glossary, that was ambitious. Everybody ready? <laughs> Users expect fast experiences. Delays of over three seconds have been shown to lead to over 40% abandonment of some websites, according to Google, in 2016. 47% of people remember this stat, Taco. 47% of people expect a site to load in under two seconds. Half of people expect a site to load in under two seconds, according to Wired Magazine. 20% of users will abandon a shopping cart and a transaction process if the process of checking out is too slow. More time is less money, and conversely, therefore, less time should equate with more money. And all the studies we have access to prove that this is the case. So um, Amazon introduced a 100 millisecond artificial delay into their browsing process, and it cost them 1% um, in revenue for every 100 milliseconds. That just scaled linearly. Um, Google introduced a 500 millisecond delay in the rendering of their search results, and it cost them 20% less click-throughs. GQ, big fashion site, had a site load of seven seconds, reduced it to two seconds, and almost doubled their organic traffic. Time is Money. Performance is opportunity. Um, Google have a great tool where you can go and play with these numbers yourselves that is based on all of those researches and more, where you can put how much traffic do we get, what's our conversion rate, what's an average conversion, and it will say, here's the money you could win every month. So, if time is money, and performance is an opportunity, and making things faster, make more money, and everything makes sense, how are we doing? It stands to reason that everybody's website is super lightning fast, and we're all on top of it, and everything loads in under two seconds. Well, we suck. We are collectively all really bad at site speed, and not just WordPress, not just PHP, but the whole web ecosystem is monumentally slow. This is an index that I won't spend ages boring you with, of um, according to Mac Metrics, who have a really good blog. Again, there's links at the bottom of all of these. You can go away and look at it on your own time. These are different industries and different countries, and the seconds to visually load it on a 3G device. So I've got a mobile phone. How long until it looks like it's done? There are very few of those that take less than 10 seconds. What percentage of all users are abandoning those brands and going to faster competitors or getting frustrated or going offline or doing other things? And even if they're coping with it and going through it, how much less likely are they to upsell or be cross-sold or engage or tweet or, or do anything positive? The thing is, 
This isn't going to be the state for long. This is because of the world we've been, uh, world we've come from and the experiences we've been through and the way that the web was. Because even if your direct competitors and the people you're up against are still slow and you're benchmarking against them and they're just as slow so there's no motivation to move forwards, they will start reacting and improving very soon. Why is that? Because Google are obsessed by speed and we all know that our ecosystem and our strategies and our brands and our sites are heavily influenced by what Google wants and how they behave and what their version of the world looks like. So in, 20, in July when they said um, people want to be able to find questions, uh, answers to questions as fast as possible and we know that speed is important, they started to really hammer on about the importance of speed finally. However, really frustratingly they said in the second paragraph, um, this will only, th this big speed update will only affect a tiny minority of pages and queries. Like, like only a few really slow or really bad sites would be impacted um, directly. Now, when you read between the lines, they're essentially saying that speed doesn't directly affect search rankings, which is incredibly frustrating because the next paragraph goes on to say almost the opposite. It says, we encourage developers to think about how performance affects user experience uh, because speed underpins experience I think user experience is a ranking factor, and arguably, from with my SEO hat on, it is the only and the biggest ranking factor, whether you call that brand, whether it's the result of good user experience, generating links and attention, and put, um, creating the kind of positive effects Google's looking for. User experience, which is underpinned by speed, is one of the most important factors in successful online marketing. Also worth considering as we go forwards, Google are not only obsessed by speed because faster sites give happier users that spend more money, they're also obsessed by speed because you achieve speed by being more efficient. You have fewer resources to download, you have better built websites, you have more efficient loading techniques, all of which saves Google a huge amount of money. Google's biggest cost center is crawling and indexing and processing the web. And if the web is slow and the web is clunky and the web is bloated and it's old, that is inordinately expensive for them. So they're um, motivated for a whole bunch of reasons, not least of which is that a faster web is a better web for them. So there's this intersect between good user experience and their crawl efficiency and getting faster websites. It's in their interest to be pushing this agenda further and further. In fact, when you look at projects like AMP, and Google PageSpeed's development um, resources, and even Gutenberg, which allows them to be much more efficient in how they crawl and consume content, this is not going to go away. Speed is going to get more and more competitive and more and more important. Efficiency improvements will continue to drive revenue for brands. If you make your website faster, you will make more money. As a universal truth, which will only become more and more true as time goes on. Because there is a commercial imperative, because there is opportunity on the table, because you can make more money with speed, that should drive progress. Who was that? <laughs> Always one. Get out. Um, but the thing is, change is behaving well at the back is hard. Change is hard. So the kinds of changes we're talking about in order to take advantage of this opportunity often require big architectural reinventions. I've got my clunky old website that it's hard to iterate on and hard to improve, and I'm stuck with yesterday's tech stack, etc., etc. Essentially, you've got to sort out all of your technical debt. You've got to adopt new technologies like JavaScript frameworks and ways of working and agile methodologies, yada, yada, yada. But more importantly, you need to develop a culture of speed. Speed isn't something that you fix once once, because then all the reasons that it's slow now will just happen again and you get slow over time. To compete on speed, you need to bake speed into what you're building. The problem is most big development projects, the kind you need to undergo to achieve this, take three, four, five years in the real world where businesses have other priorities to execute and implement. The talent you hire and the people you train and the people involved in those kinds of projects take time to find and train and spec and scope and build. This isn't the kind of thing you can fix overnight. So when Google started talking about speed in 2010, when they said today we're introducing speed into the ranking factors, nobody really paid a huge amount of attention because it was one thing amongst many others. But over the course of a timeline where you see in 2016 them saying, really guys, speed, especially on mobile, is important. It's only then that brands really start to take notice and say, you know what, okay, we need to sort out all our technical debt. It then takes them two, three, four, five years to deploy their shiny new solutions. So in 2018, the rest of it, and into 2019 and 2020, that's where we'll see those initial reactions coming to the forefront. So if you wait to react and to consider the importance of speed until your competitors are there, you only then start your three to five year journey. You already need to be on that journey, otherwise you're going to be outpaced. And particularly important because as sites get faster, slow sites are going to feel slower. The fastest experience that a consumer has will become their baseline expectation. Anything slower than that is going to feel worse and feel clunkier. So if you wait until that gap exists and then start fixing for it, 
that gap is going to get wider and your competitors are going to get further ahead. So here's the plan. What are we going to do? The thing is, it's, if you're not already way into that big web redevelopment process and re-architecting your whole platform, it's probably too late to stop. You need to change the way you approach this and find a different way to compete and to catch up. You win by making a thousand tweaks. And you make a thousand tweaks this week and you make a thousand tweaks next week and you keep making thousands of tweaks until you die. That is the only way you can compete on speed and it's the only way it makes sense to think about it. Essentially, you've just got to make bits of it faster. Like, that's so woefully oversimplistic, but that is the brief. Just keep making it. Don't try and fix the big architectural nightmare. Don't try and re-architect it. Just make bits of it faster every day, every hour. So what does that mean, and where do you start, and what do the tools look like, and how do you do it? There are two things you need to understand, two fundamental truths that underpin, underpin the entire philosophy of speed and everything you need to know about it. One is there is no such thing as speed. As a concept, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't work, it's not actionable. How do you measure speed? Okay, so let's analyze how long it takes for a page to finish loading. Nice and simple, except what does that mean? What if the page has components that only load when you interact or when you scroll? Are, are, are they finished? How, how fast was that? What, what number do you put on that experience? What happens if the page loads really, really quickly, but then very slowly loads a whole bunch of third-party adverts? Is that fast? Is it slow? Is it like, how do you understand that? What happens if the time till first byte, the amount of time until the server starts responding, is very, very fast, but then everything else trickles in really slowly? Or vice versa, actually it takes a long time to react, but then everything appears instantly. Which of those is faster? How speedy is it? It's not as simple as just a number you can measure. We need better definitions. I'm going to tear down all of the stock and default um, performance tools on the market and explain why they are awful and why you should do something else entirely. All of them suck. This is a screenshot from um, Pingdom's um, FTP where, um, speed check to FPT, FTP, FPT, speed check. And it gives you a whole bunch of things like a nice screenshot of your website and a nice performance grade and a score letter and some bits and pieces. Um, the performance grade is just taken from Google PageSpeed score, which I'll come into in a minute and tell you why that's awful, so hold that thought. <laughs> the low time of 899 milliseconds, which isn't bad, is at that point in time, for the URL I've queried, which is the home page, which isn't representative of the experience that many visitors have. It's for that specific configuration and from users from Sweden, when the weather is as it is, when the phase of the moon is as it is, when there's a major football game. Like, there are so many scenarios there that that doesn't represent any one individual human. And faster than 91% of tested sites is based on other people who've tested their pages with the same config just on their home page in the last 30 days. That's self-selecting for a very niche type of group. None of these things relate to reality. And the bits which are useful are the size of my page and the number of things on it. Well, obviously, I can make my site faster if I load fewer, smaller things. None of this is particularly enlightening. This is um, GT Metrics, which combines stats from a whole bunch of speed tools. It's well-renowned as one of the best and one of the most kind of diplomatically neutral tools. It does the same thing. It gives you relative scores to other people and their testing and other tools, none of which makes sense when you look at reality. It tells you the fully loaded time, which is its own proprietary measure of how long does it take till it's loaded, but what does loaded mean and how fast is that? There's a wonderful bit at the bottom that says leverage browser caching, i.e. on static assets. Find bits of JavaScript and CSS that you're not caching very well and improve of those, except when you open it up, can't quite see from the back, I expect, but that's Google Analytics and Google Tag Manager, neither of which I own, neither of which I can influence the JavaScript of. These are third-party dependencies and libraries that are nothing to do with me that I just use. I cannot affect the caching time of those assets. This tool is nonsense. Now, but it's not entirely true. There are some advanced techniques you can use to serve local versions of those files, but I'm not going to go into that, but it's worth chatting afterwards if you're interested. You can solve for those. <laughs> this is Google Analytics, um, which has an inbuilt speed report that only samples one in every 100 of your visitors by default. You can change that, but nobody does. So if you have one visitor in a million who comes to your site on an old mobile phone from China, all of your metrics are shot. This is absolute nonsense. Don't even look at this. It's stop. You, do you, are you filming this? <laughs> Live in the moment. <laughs> Sorry, we'll slow it down afterwards. So, so that's nonsense. Ignore that one. Um, this is Google PageSpeed Insights, which for a long time was the most nonsense of all the tools, mostly because this number, where it's, oops, ooh, what did I just do? That was exciting. Bear with. 
Too yeah. So for many years, um, many years it didn't actually scan and measure your site. It just gave you a report based on the things it thought you had done just from looking at your code. So it would, rather than saying this bit's slow, it would say you haven't done page speed stuff with this. Like these, it just gave you a checklist, and people thought it was real and it was massively misleading. So ignore all of the "you're good." What does "good" even mean in terms of speed? This bit, however is the first useful, relevant piece of information we discover in all of these tools. They have a metric um, called First Contentful Paint. This is real. This is useful. And they measure it relative to other people's experiences on other websites in similar niches. First Contentful Paint, as documented by Google, is the, um, the moment when the browser first renders any text, any image, anything that's not just a white screen. Essentially, how quickly can we show something that's not just a blank screen? How quickly can we get something there that people can start to see that it's loading? This is a really good metric to optimize for because no matter how long it takes overall and what the speed is, the faster you can get something in front of a user, the faster that's going to feel like an experience, the faster they can start reading, engaging, consuming. Let's grab an example. This is a Yoast.com blog written by McKeel, who's sat in the front. I don't know if it's any good. Um, but <laughs> there's all sorts of stuff loading here. So we are loading interaction on the nav, a big image, a video. There's, half of this is below the fold. Down at the bottom, there's tons of comments, and there's, ton, there's no comments on this one. Um, <laughs> there's like this picture of Nikhil down here. All of this happens out of sight of the user. And there's a whole bunch of techniques like lazy loading and stuff that we could do, use to say something like, what if we just did this? And we just loaded the framework of the page. We chopped out a bunch of the images. We waited to load stuff below until the people are down there. This is pretty simple. But conceptually, this makes the page feel much faster, even if it takes the same amount of time to load. Because we're getting to the stuff above the fold much more quickly, and people are seeing something that they can read and consume, that feels much quicker. It goes well beyond lazy loading into considering every byte we transfer, every color we paint to the screen, every CSS border that's introduced. All of these things have a cost. As you strip them out, you start to get much, much closer to having something useful on the screen. So we did a bunch of stuff. I've just said all of that. Um, <laughs> now, the really fun thing about this is we did this, and the site feels faster to use, but none of the scores in the tools changed. I'm like, I know this is faster. I can feel this is faster, I believe. But the scores didn't change, which brings us on to the second rule, which is that the only thing that matters is the perception of speed. If there is no perfect metric for how fast is this, the one thing we do know is important is how fast did this feel, which is obviously much harder to measure. But um, Google has a really nice paragraph on this which says that load is not just a single moment in time. It's an experience that no one metric can fully capture. And there are moments that occur during the load process where the user decides whether it feels fast or slow. That's what we need to be optimizing for. You can make it slower, but make it feel faster, and you've achieved the same goal. That said, there is one golden metric, one perfect moment that occurs in that flow which is worth universally optimizing for, which is the time to interactive. Time to first meaningful paint, time to interactive. The moment when the page has displayed useful content, i.e. time to first contentful paint, when you click on stuff, stuff happens, and it happens quickly. At what point can I start interacting with this? When is it alive? When is it away? You've all had experiences where you've loaded a site, it's ticking along, and you're trying to click on it, and it's like, oh, it's not ready yet, nothing's happening. Get away, or get, or scrap that experience entirely. Load minimal viable stuff above the fold and make it interactive and responsive. Start to split what's loading so that you only load what's necessary, what's there. All of these have links. You can go through and read the documentation on exactly how to do it. It's all very well defined, very straightforward. How quickly can we make it feel ready? That's the mission. Not how fast do we make it, not how well can we score on these tools, how quickly can we make it feel ready. Perceived speed is hard to quantify and measure. You can survey, you can analyze, but always your best tools are your eyes and your brain and trying to interact with it and get it loading as fast as quickly. The interesting thing about this kind of approach is there are lots of trade-offs. Um, there was um, some interesting conversation about GZIP in the workshop this morning. Um, everyone familiar with GZIP? Hands up if you are not. GZIP's a thing. GZIP is a, an approach for a technique for zipping content. <laughs> Up, down, in, out. And, and conventional logic says that gzip is either on or off. And if I turn it on, things are faster because servers compress stuff. If I turn it off, things are slower. This is rocket science, right? Actually, it turns out gzip has a, a variable setting from 1 to 9. And most servers will put it on like a 5 by default. If I have it on 1, my server uses very low compression, doesn't do much effort, and it ships the asset really quickly. But the asset is big and clunky, so when the user receives it, it's slow to load. Or... I put it on nine, my server spends a little while shrinking the asset down until it's really small, shipping it, and then the user loads it really quickly. Which of those is faster? 
You might be better off shipping something big much more quickly. If you know the user's on good bandwidth, good connection, you might be better off spending half a second making it really small and really efficient. This will vary by site. It will vary by connection type. It will vary by location. It will vary by server. It will vary by software. It will vary by plugins. And this is one example of a hundred things where there isn't an easy way just to make things faster. You need to start to understand and analyze what bytes are we shipping to users, in what order, with what priority, and how do we make this feel faster. It's, the, it's not an easy exploration, but this is the process you need to go through. And there are lots of moving parts you can play with. This is the W3 spec, and I apologize for how horrifically displayed it is, of everything that happens when you load a page, starting with the initial redirect and hitting an app cache all the way to the onload. The red underlined bits are the bits that you can affect stuff between. These are all moments in time as a page is requested, as a server responds, as the browser starts to render bits of it. These are bits where we can optimize. Increasingly, the world gets more complicated, and suddenly we have JavaScript frameworks and single-page apps and caching levels sat somewhere in that processing bit. And increasingly now, we've got a world of service workers and progressive web apps that occupy a space over here somewhere that interfere with how other caching works. And then we've got a whole process after the load where how you load this impacts how things work and how efficient it is. This is scary and complicated and big. The nice news is that performance optimization is no longer an art, it's no longer magic. There is a science to doing this. Every site in the world, I will stand by this, every site in the world can load in under one second. There are politics, there are tech challenges, there are issues, there are legacies, there are bottlenecks, there are platforms, but they can. There is no reason why any given site can't make those performance optimization tweaks to get to under a second. You just need to follow the rules. And the rules are simple. This is from Google. Um, you have one second. How do you spend it? That's a 1,000 milliseconds. If you're on a 4G device on a mobile phone, because everything is mobile now, this first section you can't impact. Like It takes that much time for your phone to connect to a cell tower, and you're limited by the speed of light and all sorts of big cables under the sea. That bit you can't affect. The rest of it you can impact with your hosting, your servers and CDNs, with WordPress itself, with your themes and your plugins and your configurations. And then how you factor and build your HTML, your CSS, and your JavaScript. Do you have tools to shorten these bits? You can optimize all of these to bring it down under one second. If you rule out that 300 milliseconds, that leaves you with 700 to play with. But if all your competitors are aiming for this as well, you need an advantage. Shave 100 off. You have 600 milliseconds to play with. From somebody hitting enter in a URL or clicking a link to having something visible in front of them that responds to their interactions. That's where you need to get to. And you need to measure that, you need to monitor it, you need to improve, to, uh, uh, iterate to it all the time. So let's do it. Let's go through. Wake up. <laughs> How can I possibly convey any more energy? Get a kick. <laughs> Wrong with you. So, are you? Okay, fair enough. Uh, I'll turn this around. Um, so we need a target. If we're going to make this achievable, we need an end goal. Um, Google very helpfully acknowledged that um, it's not easy to meet the one second budget, yada, yada, yada. But you're not trying to load everything and compress it all down and make it instant. You're trying to be more tactical and considered in how you load. You're going to say, within that one second framework, we just need to get stuff from above the fold that's responsive and reactive. So start by looking at these areas. You can take this away, but essentially start with time to first byte. How quickly can we make the server respond and react? How quickly can we get something on the screen? How quickly can we make it interactive? And then how quickly can we finish? Except no. That is insane. You weren't listening. I still, I, I, this is not what I've been saying. You said you win by a thousand, Jono, just now. You win by a thousand tweaks. None of this big, scary stuff. So turn this model upside down and only start with trying to shave off the big stuff that stops it loading quickly. Find the things which stop it from finishing and make them finish sooner. These are the easiest things you can do initially. Just go and find the slow stuff. And every single one of you can do this. Use the tools to spot the problems. Don't use the tools to measure and give you magical scores and trend them against your competitors. Use them to spot slow stuff. This is Yoast.com. Um, and I've gone, this is um, Pingdom's FPT tool. I've ordered this by the load time of different assets. And I've um, found this one. This is a line of JavaScript that is only four kilobytes. It's tiny, but it takes a while to load. So there's something going on there. We should make that better. But what's really interesting is it's stopping that from loading. And if I'm waiting for all these bits to finish until my page is interactive and visible and there's stuff there, that's a real issue. Like if that bit could start loading much sooner, everything would react more quickly. So we refactored that file. We went in, we chopped out some unnecessary bits, we simplified it, we updated it. It was an hour's work. Um, and this happened. That says um, 625 milliseconds. The home page loads in 0.6 seconds. That's incredible. Down from 0.8 or 9-ish, like huge impact just from unbottlenecking a thing. All of you can use the tools to find those sorts of things, point people at it and say, fix this bit. This is easy. 
Woo! <laughs> Except this is a gross oversimplification, and I've conveniently left out a difficult piece of truth, which is that that 600 millifive seconds is on a desktop, and the world is mobile, and people's experiences and frustrations and propensity to buy is much more impacted on mobile by speed than it is on desktop. On mobile, if I change my Chrome developer tools to emulate a fast 3G device, then we get down to our currency 2.77 seconds. My 0.6 seconds, my 600 milliseconds, is nearly three seconds. And when users abandon 47% of the time when it's over two seconds, maybe, that's really bad. That's slow. Oops. And there is no magic bullet for fixing this. We've got it about as fast as we can by doing big, complex architectural stuff. Now we're into a place, place where we need to chip away at that 10 milliseconds at a time, 1,000 tweaks at a time until we die. So I'm going to talk very, very quickly through some of the stuff we've already done to get there, which is all stuff you can go away and learn about and reproduce, and then some stuff we're going to do. So um, this, is, this bit's really boring. It's just lists of me reading out things, but we'll go through that anyway. Um, so there are three types. This is an oversimplification. I apologize to anyone who works for any of the hosting companies here in the room. There are three types of hosting in the world, enterprise tier, mid-tier, and DIY tier. Depending on the size and scale and nature of your site, you're going to want to pick one of those three categories. I have great experience with and recommend any of these guys, depending on those tiers. Um, obviously, we have a whole bunch of sponsors here who kind of straddle some of these areas. But in particular, SiteGround are freaking awesome for working with Yoast.com, and they do incredible things for us. WP Engine make everything very, very easy. Surfbot are doing some really smart stuff with caching. And DigitalOcean is great if you want to DIY and set something up and have a play. Other options exist. Find what's right for you. But these, if you're not using one of these or one of the sponsors, who are here today, probably review your hosting choices. If you're using a hosting company that has an animal as a logo, definitely review your hosting choices. You're making horrible mistakes. Um, we used to use MaxCDN as a content delivery network for all our images and assets and stuff, but we've switched to Cloudflare, which we use really, really heavily now. And, uh, you can go away and research this on your own time, but Cloudflare is essentially a magic wand that makes all of your assets and media much, much faster. If you're not careful, you can break your website by going in and randomly changing settings on an evening without any developer processes. <laughs> not that we know. Um, but it's like hugely powerful and do some really cool stuff with it. It makes all, it auto compresses all of your media and your assets and does a whole load of the work that your developers would otherwise have to do, which would bottleneck for ages. We do a whole lot of clever load balancing and Nginx caching stuff. I say we, um, SiteGround, do all of this for us. It's part of the reason why I love them so much. They handle all the complex servers doing things in the background stuff that I'm not an expert on. Um, Cloudflare in particular has three bits which are really, really cool, which you should at least go and play with. The page rule stuff allows you to say... Um, Cache this bit heavily, but only if the user is not from Germany and only if it's after 3 o'clock and they don't have this cookie. You can start to do some really smart stuff with redirect users conditionally, cache bits and don't cache other bits that allow you to minusculely tweak some of these areas. Um, the Argo system, you pay a bit more for, like Cloudflare is only $20 a month anyway on the basic package. This maybe takes it to 30 They intelligently route network connections, so users who are in other countries from your server get much, much faster responses. Cloudflare Workers allows you to write arbitrary code which executes at their edge nodes. So you can say, the microsecond before the page is served, switch out the canonical tag, change the HTTP headers and redirect it somewhere else, or anything, do anything you want. Huge amounts of power and flexibility and, and processing stuff. We do a whole lot of work um, optimizing the actual requests and the response from the server. So we use HTTP2 very heavily, which allows us to parallelize, par par parallelize all of our assets. So once upon a time, the web was slow, and you had to load one image at a time, and you had to use crazy things like DNS sharding. Uh, if you're not familiar with any of this terminology, I apologize. There are lots of links, or call me out on it, or shout at me, or talk to me afterwards. But definitely look into HTTP2. Here is your resource. This is a guide by Tom Anthony from Distilled, and he explains how HTTP2 and HTTP push work all through the metaphor of trucks on roads. It's incredible. Like tunnels for SSL and barbed wire and all. It's amazing. And um, this is an excellent educational resource to understand how um, you can quickly transfer for resources across the web. Um, we do a whole lot of DNS and asset pre-caching. This is something that WordPress Core doesn't do very well. If you know you're loading third-party stuff like Google Tag Manager and Google Analytics, you can tell the browser in advance. You can say, I am going to need to connect to this third-party third domain. Then all the time your browser would have spent doing SSL handshakes and DNS lookups is all done quietly in advance, and it makes third-party stuff much faster. There's a guide for that as well. Go have a look at that. It's really cool. You can do it for assets and images and logos and CSS and stuff as well. It makes things much faster when you know that you're going to load them later in a page. If you're using Cloudflare and you're doing 
preloading images, CSS, star sheets, fonts, um, JavaScript. Cloudflare can automatically upgrade those requests to HTTP to push, which means they're sent with the initial server response. So conventionally, I ask for a page and it downloads 10 bits of JavaScript that takes a while to load. With HTTP to push, you download the page and the JavaScript comes with it because the server knows that you're going to need it and it loads instantaneously. There's a trade-off because the initial response is slower, test like you would gzip. Uh, yeah, we massively reduced the amount of cross-domain resources we learned. That's really off-putting. Uh, the, the face, not so much, but the, the, the phone, not. I'm very... I don't know. I've had too much coffee. Thank you. Um, so things like jQuery and Google Analytics um, and other resources, we've taken our own copy and we serve them locally rather than um, connecting to all these third-party domains. It just means that because everything's going through Cloudflare, because everything's optimized, it all there's no bottlenecks on any of that loading process. WordPress itself has been one of our greatest enemies. Uh, as it often is. Um, we've minimized the plugin overhead enormously. We absolutely stripped back really brutally the third party stuff we rely on and we're continuing to prune that and try and develop our own solutions. There's more work to write that obviously, but if it's taking 10% of the code base and we tie it in nicely to other stuff we're doing, the efficiencies play out in the long term. Um, we've done some work managing our database indexes with SiteGround. They were very helpful in doing some of that, made it a lot faster. We use caching, this is boring. And um, we stripped out a whole lot of enqueues that WordPress does. Like WordPress enqueues a JavaScript file for converting emojis. Like, how many sites use emojis in common? Like, why is it loading? And it's a cross-domain request. Like, go look for your HTML source code, and anything that looks insane is probably insane, and get rid of it. Um, we disabled WP cron. Every time anybody loads WordPress, the backend system goes, do I need to do anything, like update plugins or check the time? Every single time. You know, like, that's a huge amount of overhead. You can turn that off, and you can roll out your own solution. That will shave 100 milliseconds off every request. It's huge. Media stuff, um, we're splitting all our JavaScript and our CSS into little files. Again, if you're in the workshop this morning, this will be familiar. But rather than having a big star sheet, we now have a star sheet for the home page, a star sheet for the footer, a star sheet for pages, which include this module or that module. And we can cleverly load only the ones we need. And then we're like 10 times faster and much, much smaller. Same applies with JavaScript and moving things to async. Fonts are a nightmare. If you're using custom fonts, load them locally, not over Google Fonts or anything like that. But also you can get um, glyph editors, which allow you to edit the font file. How many times do you use non-Western characters or interrobangs or um, advanced formula symbols? Like There are so many bits of your font file that you will never use. You can strip them out and make it much faster. We use Google Tag Manager for anything that smells like tracking scripts or analysis. So Google Analytics, Hotjar, and other stuff have all been moved out of our site into this third party. So that loads after the page is done. It doesn't impact any experience. That means we can get to that initial response much more quickly. Um, Images are a nightmare in WordPress. We use SRC sets, and we try and scale images. So one of the slowest things that holds up time till first interactive is the browser has to manage the layout of the page. It has to literally paint pixels and colors onto the screen. Images which are the wrong size for, their, the, con for the container they're in are one of the worst, slowest culprits for that. So if I've got a box that's 100 by 100 pixels and I'm loading an image that's slightly bigger or smaller than that, the browser has to calculate resizing that and squashing it in. It's phenomenally slow, like milliseconds and milliseconds. Find opportunities to get that right using combinations of media queries and SRC sets and reduce that right down. A whole load of the tools will spot these kinds of things for you. Um, Cloudflare automatically converts many of our PNG and JPEG files into WebP, which is like a sexy futuristic Google image format that's 10% of the size. Um, and we obviously use heavy caching on things like assets and images and JPEGs, etc. That's boring. Um, what's really interesting is that says 0 0.3, 397 milliseconds. That's in the last two weeks or so of just going through and making a thousand tweaks and not dying yet, but feeling like I might want to at some point shortly. Um, on mobile, that's now under two seconds. What? Consistently from around the world. Yeah, that's a whoop. That's done right. That's a whoop. Woo! Okay, so. Very quickly, in five minutes or less, what are we still doing? Because this is not done. Like, that's not fast enough. 1.9 seconds is only just under the lots of people won't bugger off because it's slow, Mark. That's not good. That's good enough for now. But So there's more to do. So I want to make better use of HTTP2 push. You can do some really sophisticated, clever stuff with this, but it gets very, very complex with handling what's been cached where and what hasn't and how does it work. There's a huge amount of reading you should do um, by this guy, Jake Archibald. It's really, really, genuinely really, really interesting. It's about the future of how HTTP requests should work. Um, and if some of the stuff he's talking about comes to pass, it will change the way that we build, um, change the way how we communicate with servers about things like images. 
politically, we are moving the whole, I don't know if this is public, but we're moving the whole of Yoast.com to canonical AMP. <laughs> not that, who cares? Um, and, uh, if you're not familiar with AMP, yeah, fine. AMP is a alternative type of HTML format designed to make pages super, super speedy, except it's heavily, heavily influenced and pushed by Google, and there are some political concerns around the shape and flavor of that. However, it's freaking awesome. Um, and the latest version of the AMP plugin for WordPress, which is coming out of beta any moment now, automatically can automatically convert your templates into AMP code. Um, works reasonably well, which makes it lightning fast, Google compliant, etc., etc. But it also does some really cool stuff with automatic tree shaking, which means those pages only load the CSS that they explicitly need. <laughs> it reads the page, it looks for the elements, it looks for the classes, and it says, I only need this bit of CSS. So all the work we would have to do of going through and micromanaging it and working all, it will do automatically, which is really cool. Um, this is the worst acronym in the world, but at some point we should go to PAMP, which is um, AMP as a progressive web app. So progressive web apps are the next generation. Ah, progressive web apps are what kills the current app store paradigm. Progressive web apps are a way to use service workers to turn your website into something that behaves like an app. You get home screen permissions, you get access to APIs, you get to make your website seamlessly transform into an app-like experience. They're really cool. You can do this now. It's a little bit complicated, but when you combine that with AMP, you get essentially instantaneous online, offline, hybrid websites that feel like apps, which is definitely the future. Um, what I haven't talked about, because I bored you all and there's lots of other stuff, is um, post-load interaction. So I've talked a lot about getting stuff on screen quickly, but when it's there, it still needs to feel fast. And the process of moving my mouse over things and clicking on things and seeing how elements interact and react has a huge impact on the perception of speed. And if Google is measuring the perception of speed rather than an actual hard speed metric, that experience still matters just as much as the initial load. So things like, does the button change color ever so slightly and does it move and indent and how do things flow? Also really, really important. There's a great resource you should read by a woman called Emily Heyman about maintaining high frame per second animations. There's a whole lot of tips around how JavaScript works with CSS, hello. Um, and you can go and dig through all of that, it's really, really cool. There are some things that we're explicitly not doing, which it's worth touching on briefly, but you might want to consider based on your setup and your use case, flapping too hard. Um, we're not lazy loading images. So conventional wisdom would, yeah, here you go. <laughs> conventional wisdom would say, if you're showing images lower down a page or you've got lots of images, don't load them all immediately, wait till the user sees them and then load them in gradually. We're not doing that because AMP will do that automatically for us. So that is one of our biggest delays at the moment. We've got like 100 milliseconds or so burnt on waiting for images that aren't even on the screen, but we'll fix that through AMP, which would be nice. We're not doing above the fold or critical path or deferred CSS. These are all similar techniques where you say, ship a tiny bit of CSS that will render the above the fold content, the stuff that's immediately viewable. Because our CSS is going to be so efficient in AMP and because it will handle a whole load of that automatically, it doesn't make sense to. If you're not looking at canonical AMP, this is the most important thing you can do. Take just the CSS you need to display your navigation, your logo, the stuff that's immediately visible, take it out of your workflow and load it immediately through something like HTTP2 push. Then the page is immediately viewable and you're not waiting on downloading all the stuff for your photo and other pages. Similarly, we're not going to invest in skeleton screens. So this is, um, I think, LinkedIn as uh, Medium or something like that. There are a whole bunch of um, modern app-like sites which load something that looks like this before they load their content. It lets you know that something's happening. The perception that it is working is much better than just a, a ticker whirring away. Again, this is all about the psychology of speed. Actually, doing something like this might slow your site down a little bit in, in actual terms, but to a user, it's going to feel much faster because something is evidently happening. Some things you can go away and look at on your own time because this is a lot to digest in however many minutes it's been. If you're starting out in this world, and you want to understand where to go, and you want to make business cases, and you want tools to start and explore, um, read um, everything that my good friend Emily Grossman has written about performance. That is a link to a video. It's really, really good. It's a similar talk to this, but much more useful and well presented. Um, <laughs> this is John Henshaw, who used to run Raven Tools, an SEO platform. He's really, uh, I, I should prefix, actually, these are the only people I would trust to talk to about um, uh, this kind of holistic speed approach. They really get it. They live it. They breathe it. John's super smart on a kind of mid level, okay, now I want to know what the code samples look like, now I know, now I want to know how this applies for this server or this term technology. Bastion is far and away at the head of the game. Um, we chat a lot about um, the next generation of this sort of stuff. He has reams and reams of, okay, here's specifically how to go about it, here's the next generation technique, here's the widgets, here's the approaches. 
If you're not already using something like Cloudflare, I will allow you to use also Max CDN or Fastly, but Cloudflare is really the wake up. Go install Cloudflare. <laughs> this will magically get you from step one to at least step three or four. Um, there's a guy called Ilya Grigorik who works for Google who writes the documentation on all of, the, all of their best performance optimization guides. He's phenomenal. Follow him on Twitter. Read all of his stuff. Google's educational resources on this sort of stuff are incredible. This is the web fundamentals bit of their paid speed guides. Go and consume all of this. It's like I learn new stuff about web performance every time I read this. It's amazing. Um, if you're not looking at AMP, at least go think about it. I get that it's politically loaded and it's an alternate version of HTML, which isn't necessarily the best way for the world to go. But it's so fast and it's so much easier to bolt on top of a broken site than it is to fix a site. Go out and win like a rainbow unicorn kitten. You have all the tools you need to make your site load in under one second. I expect benchmarks and performance before this time next week. Make a thousand changes. Don't try and rebuild your entire architecture and your site and your business. Just go and find the slow things and make them faster. Thank you very much. <laughs> I forgot to put a time lock on my screen, so I have no idea how long that was, but your face says it was too long. Spot wow. Spot on. Spot on. Okay, who was afraid he was going to run out of breath? <laughs> <laughs> how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. I could use a coffee. Good. Coffee? <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> no coffee for Tono, please. When you see him, offer him anything with no coffee. <laughs> no caffeine for me. Hmm. Okay, that needs to sink in a little. Huh? Yeah, yeah, it's a lot. Sorry. Okay, questions already? <laughs> Everyone's destroyed. Like so. I don't know. They are. Can you please repeat? Uh, repeat the question. The question. Can I please repeat the question? Yes, I can. Uh, after, yeah. The, before. <laughs> I just want to say that was the best, best ending screen to a presentation ever. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's my favorite. That's that's what you want to aim for. <laughs> hmm. Um, you mentioned AMP. But yes. What about Facebook's alternative? Yeah, so same principle. Um, but that's so. So I didn't listen. Um, so I mentioned um, AMP. Um, what about Facebook's instant articles, which is a similar kind of thing? So AMP is particularly important because Google rewards but doesn't reward pages that are on AMP because um, you get access to the featured news carousel in the search results and when you click on one of those results you're taken to a cached version of that page on Google servers which preloads and goes instantly. Also, your AMP pages are going to be discovered by and visited and consumed by users searching and finding your site. So it kind of has this external global reach in theory. Facebook Instant Articles will only apply to people who are already going to see your content in their feed. Now, what's interesting about Facebook Instant Articles is um, you're essentially giving away your content to Facebook and removing the right to market or um, advertise or convert from it. So, um, and at least you get, I make my website faster and better. Facebook, you're just like, have my content. So, hmm, risky. Fair enough, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I'm very curious into what you see as some of the SEO disadvantages of, of AMP because as I see it, speed is marvelous and uh, you know like it is very quickly, uh, well it's, it's a long story but yeah we did fuck up for many years and they kind of solved the issue yep. so, and we're not the ones to complain but there is a, a trade-off that uh, it can hurt your conversion and it can hurt your SEO so can you uh, into that. Yep, so um, what is the SEO disadvantage of AMP? And I guess the broader disadvantage and the rest, this could be a whole talk, so I'll try and do something very fast. Um, <laughs> AMP, is a, AMP is a largely proprietary, AMP is in theory open source and in theory a product of the community, but is 90% owned and influenced by Google. It is a proprietary, almost proprietary, and competing format and standard for HTML. So you have normal HTML, we have AMP HTML. And it is very rigidly defined about the kinds of things you can and can't do. Like You can't load your own JavaScript, which many of the sites in the world use for adverts or for functionality, things like jQuery, etc. You can only use the elements that they allow. So you have to use AMP images rather than images, and you have to do your analytics this way, and you have to have their menu rather than your menu. Your 
flexibility and your creativity is somewhat limited by their framework. Now, they're getting better at that, and it's still an evolving standard, but it's not quite there yet. So you make this kind of weird extra alternate version of your website that coexists alongside your existing one, and it's not as designed, it's not as interactive, and you sacrifice things like your internal advertising and other external dependencies and tracking, and you have to maintain both of those versions forever. And the analytics doesn't quite hook up very well. It's, it's very imperfect as a standard. But everybody's mobile website is slow. And it's easier to go, we'll build a separate thing over here that's faster and reap the benefits from SEO and Google than it is to fix your underlying problem. Many, many big brands use it as a, as a plaster. They go, it's too hard to fix our slow site. We'll just do AMP. And the scary thing is nobody's quite sure, will it, will it stay around for years to come? What happens if it disappears? Because I've got URLs and content on here. If Google are successful with it and it does persist, then it replaces the open web because AMP HTML becomes normal HTML, which has scary political implications. Like that, that might be fine, but it might be a horrific dystopia and nobody's really in the driving seat. Um, it's still unfolding. Like I, I would tactically, for tactical reasons, adopt it now. Um, especially with the canonical AMP WordPress approach because it's easy to turn it off. You get the advantages and it does make things faster and easier. But yeah, you're going to impact your conversion rate. It's not going to be suitable for all sites. It's better for like your e-commerce store might do really badly from it, but your new site might do quite well. There's also a real challenge where if you only do some of your site in AMP, like I will do my news articles but not my product pages, that's a really disjointed, disjunctive experience going between them. And then you get, well, I don't understand as a user. So uh, make a case-by-case -case choice. But yeah, it's, it's not, not a perfect solution by any means. We have time for one more question. One more. Is it the end only for a website with an international target audience or is it for any Good audience? question. Um, is a CDN only sensible or right for a uh, site with a large international audience? Absolutely not. So CDNs historically were primarily designed to say, I, my server is in London. If a user comes from Australia, serve them a copy of my site on my images from Australia. Don't make them connect all the way across the world. And many CDNs were designed primarily to solve for that problem, distribute the assets and serve them locally. Increasingly, CDNs as a market are evolving to also do um, on-the-fly performance optimization and security and things like app functionality, some more or less depending on the level of purism. Cloudflow is a really good example that just does a hundred things, only one of which is really the kind of geo element. It's one of their big cells, but it does things like the automatic WebP conversion is a really great example, like upgrade all of my images on the fly improve the compression, automatically minify my JavaScript. Like the, the geographic component is quite small in their overall offering. Others do more or less. Um, Max CDN is much better at um, analytics, interestingly, than Cloudflow or Fastly. Like if you want to understand image by image the performance and the throughput, go with Max CDN. If you're a bigger business and you want to do more sophisticated, complex stuff, go with Fastly. But Cloudflare's the best. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just very quickly, um, again, I know there was a lot to digest there. There are links underneath each of the images in there. There are huge amounts of reading. Like This is the product of years and years of just scrolling through this stuff. I will put the deck on SlideShare somewhere, show it up here somewhere, but go and, go and read. Like There's definitely some stuff you can do here just to make your site a bit faster, and the world will be a better place for it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.